So chapter 27 is talking about somatologic and lymphatic system function, assessment, and therapeutic measure. Hematologic, sorry. Normal hematologic and lymphatic system anatomy and physiology. Will somebody read the first paragraph? The hematologic system includes the bone marrow, blood, and blood components. The lymphatic system includes lymph nodes, nodules, which filter pathogens for destruction and lymph vessels, which return lymph to the blood. The general functions of blood are transport of substances, regulation of body temperature, pH, and fluid balance, and transport of cells that offer the body protection. The human body contains four to six liters of blood. Approximately 45% is formed elements. The remainder is plasma. All formed elements are produced from stem cells in the red bone marrow and flat bones, irregular bones, and epiphysis of long bones. Okay. So we do point out to you all um, that the human body, we have four to six liters of blood um, in the average person. And four to six liters is if you take a two liter pop, two bottles of that, either two or three bottles of that represent how much blood the average um, adult will have in a body. And one of the words it points out in plasma that you all need to take heed to is albumin. And you can mm hear -hmm. with albumin, it helps maintain blood volume and pressure by pulling tissue fluid into the venous ends of the capillary network. <clears throat> network. But to simplify, it helps maintain blood pressure. So with decreased albumin, we know that a patient may be at risk for hypovolemia. With increased albumin, patient may be at risk for hypervolemia. Uh, and it also talks about vasoconstriction. Where is this term at? Basal, what do that mean? What is vasoconstriction? Basal constriction, basal dilation. Basal constriction is referring to the venous, um, the um, vascular system. It refers to the vascular system. And constriction is just tightening up. When I think of basal constriction to kind of compare it and to help um, an individual understand what basal constriction does to the body, I kind of think of having <clears throat> two different straws. One straw is a real big straw, and the other straw, to think about the, the coffee straw people stir their coffee up with and they suck the um, coffee out, they drink the coffee out of. So to think of having a real big straw where you're able to put in your Kool-Aid and you're able to just drink that Kool-Aid comfortable, it don't require too much pressure to suck out that straw. But to think of a coffee straw where that straw is so much thinner I look at that straw as vasoconstriction. That straw is vasoconstriction because it's a kind of a constricted, a narrow straw. And when you suck out of it to get your coffee, you have to suck hard. And it requires a lot more pressure to suck out of that straw. So with vasoconstriction, um, the message is vasoconstriction will result in high blood pressure. Your patient experience in vasoconstriction it results in high blood pressure. Individuals who smoke cigarettes or whatever, or who smoke, will experience, experience vasoconstriction for an hour. Typically, you experience vasoconstriction for an hour, so we know that cigarette smoke do contribute to high blood pressure. And vasodilation would be the opposite. What would vasodilation contribute to? Low blood pressure. No blood pressure. Yeah. A lot of this is AMP, and if you need to sharpen up on your AMP, make sure you read all of that information.
And it's telling you some more values that I will hold you all accountable for. You need to know the normal range for red blood cells. You need to know the normal range for hematocrit. You need to know the normal range for hemoglobin. You need to know the normal range for white blood cells. That's what I will hold you accountable for at this current time. And you need to know the significance of those values. If an individual have increased white blood cells, we want to think the possibility of infection. If an individual have low white blood cells, now we're thinking about production. Is there an issue with production or is there some type of cancer going on? You also need to know the normal range for platelets. You need to know the normal range for platelets. What is the function of platelets? What is platelets beneficial for? Blood clotting. It's beneficial for clotting. Right now, you can cut your arm. You can put pressure on your arm to stop the bleeding. And what happened is, you know, some of the white blood cells um, travel to that area, you know, to help um, decrease the risk of infection. And you also have platelets that travel through that area to, to um, create the clot. And that clot is what stop, helps stop the bleeding, that type of thing. But we also know having too many platelets in the human body can contribute to stroke or it can co contribute to a clot formation, that type of thing. So not enough platelets will cause me to bleed out. A clot cannot be formed because I don't have enough platelets which will result in me bleeding out. Having too many platelets can um, result in a blood clot. And that clot can travel and lodge in any area of the body. And depending on what area it lodges in dictates what's going to occur. Because if a clot lodges into my heart, we know that is about to decrease tissue perfusion to my heart. And that, that can result in heart failure. Okay, And it also tells you decrease um, platelet is called thrombocytopenia. And anytime I hear the word penia, I'm thinking of something that's low in the blood. Penia makes me think of something that's low in the blood. And thrombocytosis is increased platelets. But decreased platelets is thrombocytopenia. So you can see a test question. Patient has decreased platelets, what that mean? Or patient is experiencing thrombocytopenia what should what should concern a nurse? And when your patients um have low red blood cells, we do um want to try non-pharmacological interventions and non-pharmacological interventions is educating them about the need to increase their um, protein and iron levels to help them build up hemoglobin, which helps produce red blood cells. We also can start them on iron pills. And one of the things about iron pills that nurses have to know is that the iron pills can change the color of the individual stool, where they stool looking um, black that type of thing, dark stool, some black stool. So we know it's normal for your stool to be black if you are on iron um, supplements, that type of thing. I do have a question, Mr. Williams. Yes. So you know how they say, well, I don't know how true it is, but they say if you take like Pepto-Bismol and it turns your stool color, you know, darker color, you shouldn't continue to take it. So why is it okay with the iron peels turning the stool a different color, if that question makes sense. Well, some stuff can change your stool a different color and it can be causing an issue. Mm -hmm. Some things can change your stool a different color and it may be okay because there's some peels where, hey, you take this peel, your urine gonna look orange. You know, it's been scientifically tested or whatever, where the average person urine will turn orange from this, um, particular medication, but it's okay. So it just depends because some stuff, it can be causing me to um, bleed internally 
where it's like, hey, if it changes the color of your arm, uh, your stool, that's a definite concern. Where this medication, if your stool gets to look in orange or it look like blood in it, you need to go to the hospital immediately. So it just depends on the medication, on what that medication is doing to the body. So some medication just have like a dye in it or may have substances that may actually change up some colors where some um, things that may change color, it may be a, a, a sign of something. Okay, thank, thank you. You're welcome. And it talks about white blood cells where we know white blood cells are used to help fight infection or whatever. And that's pretty much the um, thing with our immune system. Our immune system is used to help fight infection, but sometimes our immune system isn't as quick or isn't as effective as um, different medications, as the different medications. Read um, lymphatic system, the first um, paragraph. So. You said which uh, paragraph? First one, lymphatic system. The lymphatic system consists of lymph, lymph vessels, lymph nodes, and nodules, the, the, the spleen and the thymus. Functions of the lymph system include the return of tissue fluid. To, main, to maintain blood volume and protecting the body against pathogens and other foreign materials. Immunity is covered off in uniform. Keep going. No, that's fine, thank you. Okay. And this particular box is important that you all learn um, the information that's in this box is talking about the different blood types, how um, you have to know the compatibility of the different blood types. And with the different blood types, you have individuals who have type A blood, individuals who have type B blood, individuals who have type AB blood, and individuals who have um, type O blood. And with type A blood, just to say right now, I'm at the hospital and I need a, um, a blood transfusion. Um, sorry, an individual who has type A blood, who needs a blood transfusion, that um, individual, if I was to go in the hospital, I need, I'm type A, I would need another individual who's type A as well um, to receive a blood transfusion from them. Or I can use an individual who's type O. Type O is considered a universal um, donor. So with an individual, if you are type O blood, that means that you can donate blood to anybody. An individual with type A blood, type B blood, or type AB blood. You can donate, a type person with type O blood can donate their blood to anybody. An individual whose uh, blood type is A, they can only receive blood from an individual who is type A or who is type O. An individual who's type B can only receive blood from an individual who was type B or type O, an individual who is type AB can receive bl um, blood from any of these people. So the individual who's a type, who is type A and B, who's type AB, they are considered the universal recipient 
the universal recipient where I can receive blood from any of you. The individual who is type O is the uh, universal donor. They can give any of these people blood. So you need to be clear with that. And sometimes it can, um, blood incompatibility can occur where, hey, this blood wasn't um, compatible. So you have to be careful if you ever had to give a transfusion that you are making sure everything is appropriate for that patient. So it is a verifying process where you have to read to make sure it's the right blood, make sure these numbers match, that type of thing. You go through a whole verifying process if you have to um, administer blood. And then it's a whole process before blood is actually administered that nurses have to um, go through. And this just talks about your spleen and with the human spleen, um, red blood cells are recycled, platelets and um, the spleen is where red blood cells are recycled, platelets and white blood cells are stored in the spleen and it helps to fight some bacterial infection. And you all know an individual can live without a spleen because the liver and red bone marrow can fulfill some of the same functions as the spleen. But however, without a spleen, a patient um, risk for infection increases. And this just talks about the thymus how the thymus gets smaller with age and that we can live without a thymus as well. And the thymus contains T lymphocytes, T cells, um, and the T cells to help with the immune system. So the thymus do have some impact on the immune system. And let's just show you the lymphatic system where the different, um, where the lymphatic system is, is throughout the entire body, the lymphatic system. And with the lymphatic system, you know that um, individuals can have lymph nodes pop up in different areas. And typically when them lymph nodes go to popping up, if those lymph nodes are popping up in a localized area, that is more of a sign of, um, when they pop up in a localized area, more of a sign of a local infection. But when you have lymph nodes emerging systematically, I got them in my neck, I got them under my arms, I got them in my abdomen, I got them in the pubic area, that type of thing, got them popping up at my feet, you have some type of systematic infection. So when they are local or whatever, a localized area, that can be a, um, you know, a localized infection. So when you have them everywhere, it's like a systematic infection that's going on. And it just talks about the aging um, lymphatic system and hematologic system where um, you have an aging system has less efficient immune response. They experience iron deficiency, increased risk for infection, anemia, and dehydration. Uh, questions to ask during a health assessment when you are screening patients for different things. Why is family history important? Why is it important to ask your patient about their family history? Some things could be hereditary. Yeah, because some stuff is hereditary. Some stuff is just running a family. Your grandma, your auntie, your daddy, they all get cancer. Oh, you are at high risk for cancer. You need to be screened early. You need to go on to be screened early. So family history um, can be an indicator of your health and what you are up against. So it's important to learn your family history. Hey, what diseases run in this family? So I can know what I need to be watching for, that type of thing. It talks about a bone marrow biopsy. What is that? The bone marrow biopsy. 
Is it oh, no. taking the white cells out of the bone marrow? Well, they are drawing fluid out of the um, bone marrow. What are they testing for? What are they testing for? What is a biopsy for? Cancer. Cancer. Yeah, that's what I was looking for y'all to say. But biopsy don't only test the cancer. Biopsy can test for any disease. But the whole thing is, you know, everybody don't want nobody sticking a no big needle up in them to test for different diseases. So most of the time when we think of a biopsy, we think of more so a test for cancer, but a biopsy can be used to diagnose multiple diseases other than cancer. What would be your concern if I had to have a lung biopsy? What is your concern as my nurse? I just had a lung biopsy. What's the concern? Lung cancer? No, if I just I just had a lung biopsy, post lung biopsy, what is your concern as my nurse? What should concern you? That your lung could collapse. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Let me listen to your lung sounds to make sure that they did not prick your lung when they did that biopsy. Let me look at the site. The site that the lung, I mean, that the um, needle was inserted in to check for bleeding, to make sure that you are not bleeding profusely. That type of thing. So you want to think about what are some of the um, concerns? What are some of the huge concerns? Lymph and geography, when I hear graphy, what do this word make you think? To record. Yeah, some type of recording, some measurement. Um, makes me think like x-ray, that type of thing. I was talking about coagulation um, studies. Um, you need to know that INR should be less than um, 1.3 for an individual who's on a medication warfarin. Warfarin is a blood thinner. Um, that that individual INR should be between 2.0 and 3.0. And the, when you're looking at pro, pro, prothrombin time, international, international normalized ratio to INR, that type of thing, this stuff is coagulation studies. How long do it take for you to clot? So it's a certain time range that we should be clotting. If we cut our arm within um, 9.6 to 11.8 seconds is the normal range for the prothrombin time, for the time and for us to clot. The APTT um, um, normal range is 25 to 39 seconds before the before you were able to clot. So this is nothing but a coagulation study telling you how soon you should be clotting. When we look at these levels, your prothrombin time is 15 seconds, which meaning that it takes you 15 seconds to clot, you are at risk for bleeding out because we know 9.6 to 11.8 is the normal um, amount of seconds it should be occurring. That type of thing. So you want to know the normal range for prothrombin time and all these different lab values that you should know. I would just write it out on a sheet of paper, write the lab values next to it and make sure I'm studying at least five a day. And then take a blank sheet of paper, write calcium down, write pro, um, PT down, INR down, and where you write down the ranges you remember to make sure you are memorizing these normal ranges because this information will pop back up on tests. So you need to know the normal PT range, INR range, and APTT range. And we're talking about blood administration. And typically in Michigan, our RN has to start uh, 
a blood transfusion. And it talks about some of the different blood products that can be transfused. Red blood cells can be transfused, frozen red blood cells, platelets, albumin, uh, fresh frozen plasma, that type of thing. These are the different blood products that can be transfused. Um, before blood is transfused, our RN needs to verify with another nurse all the um, pertinent information. We need to ver verify this is the right um, drug. I mean, this is the right um, blood type, that type of thing for the person, that this um, blood type is for the particular person that it was ordered for. There's numbers on it you have to verify. It's a lot of information that has to be verified. I have administered uh, blood to several patients or whatever. So it's some things you have to verify. And before you actually hang blood, we need to get the patient vital signs. Before blood is hung, we need to get the patient vital signs. So some patients will have a transfusion um, reaction. So it tell you right here, timing, you need to, uh, blood need to be transfused over two hours. And blood cannot sit longer than four hours. If it sits longer than four hours, you need to be sending that back to lab um, so that they can throw it away, so it can be thrown away. So again, with blood transfusion, we want to infuse that blood over two hours. Blood should not be sitting longer than uh, four hours. And it talks about filtering, where uh, filters can be uh, used with a blood transfusion to prevent like different uh, particles from entering the patient body. And they can warm blood. Some blood can uh, be in the freezer, that type of thing where it's cold, where the blood sometimes has to be uh, warm because if it's too cold, it can cause a transfusion reaction. And anytime a patient has an IV going, if you realize, hey, something ain't right with this IV, or hey, this patient turning extra red, or this patient complaining that it's a lot of pain, or something wrong with me, nurse, you need to stop the IV and report it to the physician. You want to stop the IV immediately, and you want to report it to the physician. And it just talks about monitoring a patient is receiving blood right before we administer blood. We need to get a set of vital signs on them. So we can have some baseline vital signs on them. And typically within 15 minutes of a blood transfusion is where um, a patient will have a reaction. Within the first 15 minutes of transfusing blood, the patient will typically have a reaction. So a nurse has to remain there with that patient for the first 15 minutes when a transfusion is occurring. Um, and then a nurse can have like a, um, a, well, they can have an LP and a CNA, that type of thing to monitor the um, patient after that. Literally the first 15 minutes is where your patient is at risk for a transfusion reaction. And it talks about the complications. Um, do not be fooled. It is a serious procedure that can be life-threatening if errors occur. And it talks about a febrile reaction where some patients, they can uh, develop a fever uh, due to the transfusion. And if the patient develop a fever, typically with a fever, we like to give patients Tylenol or Motrin, that type of thing. But most of the time, we would get them Tylenol if they develop a uh, fever. It talks about patients can get hives. If a patient is getting hives, that's making me think they have an allergic reaction. Um, it talks about the hemolytic reaction. That's the deadliest. That is a complication of the transfusion. The cause of this reaction is transfusion of incompatible, uh, incompatible blood. And again, if you recognize that anything is going wrong when a patient is receiving a transfusion, IV medication, or anything like that, you need to stop it. Um, it also talks about anaphylactic reaction. Of course, we know anaphylaxis can result um, in death. It can be life-threatening. Make sure you all uh, record your name. It's 11 o'clock every hour on the hour. You need to record your name and a time. And once the transfusion is over, um, you need to get another set of vitals. So you need to get three sets of vitals 
on a patient who's receiving a transfusion. They need to have um, pre vitals. Um, they need to have vitals 15 minutes following a transfusion, where we're looking at those vitals to see, hey, your temperature is all of a sudden increasing really high, or hey, your heart rate then went up um, extremely high, that type of thing. We need to look at their vitals. Okay. Mr. Williams, um, Nene said her um, internet went out at the moment. So that's why she's not on here. 